Hey everybody! Welcome to a new video of the Jitter Gen series from Zero to Hero. So in this series, we basically take a look at all the objects inside the Jitter Gen, we try to give a thorough explanation for them, and we use uh, we see how we can use them kind of in a creative way. So in this episode, we are going to see how we can use those objects or functions inside Jitter Gen to actually create three-dimensional shapes. We're going to use an object that you are probably familiar with, it's called GGL Mesh. This is an OpenGL object. Um, and this, what it does, it basically takes a matrix as an input and it uses the values inside this matrix, those numbers, as basically three dimensional coordinates for, um, for vertices in uh, our three dimensional space. Okay, so let's dive in and see how we can do that. Okay, so let's start from scratch. Uh, we will start with a new patch. And uh, the first object we are going to create is a JIT world object. Now, this is part of the OpenGL um, system of objects inside MaxMSP that we use to create three dimensional graphics. And I've talked about this object in other videos. So, if you don't know at all uh, what is the JIT world object and what does it do, um, I can you can check my other videos on the subject. Okay, so let's give it. Uh, Let's give it a name. This will be the name of our OpenGL context, which the objects need to know where they should render. And let's call it um, tut06, uh, because this is the number. This is the sixth tutorial of the JitGen um, from 0 to Hero series. And okay, let's give it a couple of attributes. So, for example, full scale anti aliasing. Let's give it the floating attribute. Let's give it the size of the window and let's give it also an erase color of... Uh, now let's actually not give it an erase color, we will change these uh, manually. And let's enable it by default, so by default it will already start rendering. Okay, pretty cool. Let's now change our uh, background color. We can do that like this. Prepend erase color. Then we can use uh, an object like, for example, this watch object to change the color of our background, because this object gives us the color format exactly in the red, green, and blue, and alpha format, which is the format accepted by JIT World. Okay, pretty cool. So now, uh, let me choose just one color, cool. Now let's create a JIT matrix, uh, three planes, float 32, 10 by 10. Now, why am I creating a three planes matrix? because every one of the planes of the matrix is going to be filled with x, y, and z uh, values for the vertices of our shape. Okay, so the first plane will be filled with the x component, the second plane will be filled with the y component, and the third plane will be filled with the z component. So let's create now a JGen object. And then the object that uh, it's kind of the focus of this tutorial, which is the GGL mesh. It needs the name of our GL context to know where to render. Uh, we can give it a color. Let's make it white, for example. And it's going to be it for the moment. Now, the GGL mesh, as you can see, has a lot of inputs. Uh, we will focus only on the first uh, on the first one, maybe the second one, and we will focus on the fourth one as well. The others, for the moment, we don't care at all. So the first input is the input of the vertex array, which basically means the information in the format x, y, and z that are going to contain uh, the position of our vertices in the space. And this um, this must be a three-dimensional matrix, sorry, a three-plane matrix, because um, it must contain three, uh, three values per cell, right? So this is why we created a three-plane matrix. So we connect this to the input, to the first input. Let's connect also the bang from the cheat world object uh, to the cheat matrix. So for every frame, we are banging this matrix. Let's double click. Okay, and now we are inside our cheat gen. Now, if you remember, if you remember the object uh, S norm, this is the one that we are going to use in the beginning. So S norm. Uh, I, if I attach it to the output, it will create this, uh, this plane. Oh, and by the way, let me connect a GGL handle object to this uh, uh, GGL mesh so we can uh, move it with the mouse. Exactly. So, as you can see, it created a plane. Now, if you remember, the JIT, uh, the S norm generator, 
basically creates um, coordinates for every cell of the matrix, um, for every dimension of the matrix. So if this matrix has two dimensions, this object will generate two planes of coordinates, and the first plane will be the x coordinates, and the second plane will be the epsilon coordinates. Okay, so from uh, the dimension of the matrix, this object generates so it generates as many planes as there are in uh, dimensions in the matrix, but never going above the actual uh, planes in the matrix. Okay, so this is going to be um, a three-plane matrix here on the output. You can check this using the GTFPS GUI object. So this is a three planes matrix in the output and the first two planes, let's check also the, the third plane. So the first two planes are filled with the um, X component, X coordinates of the matrix and the second plane is filled with the Y coordinates of the matrix going from minus one to one, as you can see on the Y axis. And uh, the third plane is just filled with zero. Okay, because the, the S norm object will fill as many planes with the coordinates as many dimensions are in the input matrix. The matrix that come in the leftmost input, actually. Okay, so we could also do something like this. We could explicitly create a back tree. So with three components, switch the X component of the S norm, which is going to be the X, uh, the X coordinate. Then we get the Y coordinate. And we use it for the Y. We could also use it for the Z, and then this will be a flat plane, right? But we can also use it for the Y. Okay, very well. Uh, let's now take a look at the poly mode 1-1. One, one. Okay, cool. So what happened here? Now we are representing the, 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 the shape, so the polygons, not anymore as completely filled uh, faces, but as the wireframe that actually composed the shape. Okay, and we are seeing them uh, in what is called a triangle grid, because it's a grid made of triangles, as you can see. Basically, everything in computer graphic, all the three-dimensional shapes in computer graphic are created from triangles. So when we talk about um, three-dimensional shapes, we basically talk about a bunch of triangles uh, united together to create this shape. And we can see now these individual triangles together. Every one of these uh, intersections of the triangles, every corner basically of the triangle, this is a vertex. We could also visualize the vertices as dots. Uh, let's create though, let's make, let's give it the point size a bit bigger. Okay. So we can visualize it directly like dots. Um, and these dots are exactly the vertices that compose our shape. And these vertices are in these positions because this is what came out from the S norm object. So this, for example, the first, the first vertex up here, but actually this is a uh, kind of flipped. So the first vertex is up here. This will be at position minus one, minus one. And as you can see, this is the first uh, cell here on the top left. So it will have minus one for the X axis and minus one for the Y axis. And all the vertices are uh, placed in the space according to those numbers that come out from S norm. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Okay, now let's see what else we can do with that. For example, if we would have just a single plane matrix, the S norm object will not generate the Y coordinate. So this actually just contains a zero now, actually gets filled with the same value as the X coordinate. So it's basically just generate, just generating one, um, one set of coordinates because there is only one dimension, right? And we don't see the shape anymore because the GGL mesh has an attribute called draw mode, which basically lets us decide in which way the mesh should represent uh, the shape. A three grid, which is the default way, needs a two-dimensional matrix at least to be represented. So it will not work with a one-dimensional matrix like this is now. So we could, for example, represent these like points. And this is what we see now. So why do we see that? Because the X coordinates and the Y coordinates have the same values. So we have, for example, minus one, minus one for the X and the Y, minus 0, 0.78, minus 0, 0.78 uh, on the second dot and so on, right? So we can choose uh, seven different ways of uh, representing our shape. Now I'm also still in poly mode two, two. So let's actually go back to poly mode zero, zero with the full phases. And let's represent this, for example, as lines, which basically connects two vertices with a line and then the other two vertices with a line and so on. 
or we can use the line strip which connect all the vertices with a single line. Let's increase also the line width. So line width we can increase for example to 4. So line strip creates a line and so on. We can have a line loop which should connect the, the, the end and the beginning of the line and so on. So but for the moment let's stay with line strip which represent the vertices as a single line. Okay, very well. Now we can use, for example, some of the um, some of the functions that we saw in the past videos, for example, to uh, decide which where are going to be the vertices in the space, right? So, for example, we could say uh, greater than zero point five. So when the x is greater than zero point five, then this will be one. Otherwise, this, the epsilon coordinates will be zero, right? And this we know that this is, is where the x coordinates are greater than 0 0.5. Now there is another, there is a gap here because uh, we got only 10 vertices. So if we increase it to 100 vertices, then we will have a much more vertical uh, jump. So basically here is 0, the center, because otherwise x goes to minus 1. And this is uh, the center 0, this goes to 0 0.5. Then when this is greater than 0 0.5, the epsilon value is going to be 1. Okay, we could get, for example, only the absolute value of the ip of the x so this will be the same then we will mirror the thing on the um, on the negative axis we could uh, for example uh, for example multiply this uh, now we could take for example uh, the modulo 1 and then for example multiply this by 10 so now we will have or oh, let's maybe multiply this by 5 all right. So now this goes between minus five and, and five, but we take the modulo one and then we take the absolute value of that. And then we say when this is greater than 0 0.5. So now uh, the modulo one will be just something like this. Exactly. Let's maybe take the absolute value of that. Okay. The modulo one will be something like this. So from zero here, it goes to one, then it goes back to zero. Then we got all the, all the float numbers until one. Then we go back to zero, then all the float numbers until one and so on. And if we take the only when it's greater than 0 0.5, then we get this kind of square wave. It's pretty cool. Uh, in order to center this on the epsilon axis, uh, uh, we could, for example, just uh, subtract 0 0.5 to that right because then we bring it uh, we bring it down of 0 0.5 units okay then for example we could uh, use the sign to have another uh, to have another periodic function we could use the sign as the epsilon value and then we will have a nice sine wave if we increase here the x domain let's say we get more waves right Exactly. And the more cells we've got, then the more smooth this is going to be. Exactly. Uh, if we want to adjust the amplitude of this sine wave, we can multiply the output of the sine wave for something smaller than one, and then we get a smaller amplitude, right? Then we could, for example, animate this shape using, for example, uh, an external uh, input. I will call it time using our param object that we saw in the previous videos. And then we can use an object from the JITMO package, which is JITMO time, which will be automatically synced with the render of our JIT world. So we actually have even to tell it to draw to toot 06. Let's give it automatic one. So it will automatically start outputting our our numbers and this is the time in seconds since it was created very cool so we can just say then prepend time and use this as our time inside the jit gen so then inside the jit gen object we can um, where should we put that we should we put that after the multiplication because then this simply becomes an offset simply becomes an offset in our uh, on the x domain we can then for example multiply this uh, by something bigger to have it go faster okay pretty cool or we could just for example change the speed attribute of the cheat mode object so if we make it go faster or slower and so on uh very well we could for example create a two-dimensional matrix here let's go back to 200 by 200 vertices Alrighty, let's actually delete the seed cell block for the moment. Cool. So now we can also use the epsilon coordinates. 
So we say the epsilon coordinates we can use, for example, as the epsilon values. Let's actually use the lighting enable attribute for a JIT GL mesh. Now, the problem is that when we use the lighting enable, the lighting will not work properly because the object doesn't have any normals by default. So the normals are something that is necessary to calculate the light in three dimensional shapes. And a normal, I think I, I spoke about this in some previous tutorials, but anyway, a normal is a, a vector that is perpendicular to the surface, okay? So we can actually let the object calculate automatically its own normals by using the attribute auto normals one. And now we'll automatically calculate normals, okay, which completely, um, which completely didn't improve at all, but uh, let's see when we start to uh, modify the shape if something is going to improve. So for example, we could sum those two uh, values, the x and the y, then take the, the sign of those values and use this as the, as the zeta component. Let's then actually uh, multiply this by something bigger. So for example, 10. Okay, and this is what we got you can pretty much uh, start to mess up with this stuff and have some fun. For example, oh, this looks like a little, uh, like a little springy thing. Uh, in order to have a better, light, a better lighting, we can actually attach a GGL material to the, to the GGL mesh object. And we can give it a matte diffuse color of one and let's just connect it here. And now we have kind of a better lighting a bit better, not com not super better, but a bit better it is. So yeah, for example, we could um, get, instead of summing simply those two values together, we could get the length of the coordinates of the cell going from minus one to one, and then use these as the sine value. And this is what we get. Let's actually multiply this amplitude for something smaller, for example, 0 0.2, right? And then, uh, or maybe something slightly bigger, 0 0.4, for example. And then if we, we can also animate these as we did before with the time, plus time multiplied by 10, for example. And then we have this kind of bouncy shape. Sadly, the lighting is not working super correctly. Okay, this at least lets us better understand how the shape is. Okay, so since we get the length from the center to all the to all the points in the um, in the shape, this will be a vector that goes from the center to every point in the shape, and then we can basically multiply this vector and take the sign of it and get this uh, interesting, uh, strange uh, stuff going on. If we want to uh, the ripples to go the other way around, we just uh, do minus time instead of plus time. Now, uh, there is a bunch of objects also inside uh, the JIT gen, which generate complete shapes, like basically uh, some of the shapes that we got in the GGL grid shape object. For example, we got the sphere, we got the torus, we got the cone, we got the plane, I think, which is basically the S norm. We got the circle, and uh, we got a couple more that you can find in the max reference. No, I don't remember all of them, but just a couple more that you can find in the max reference. So we basically now got already a sphere uh, without using a GGL mesh. This is the kind of using the equation of the sphere, we, which we could also write uh, ourselves, but this is just already written inside uh, this object. And we can then modify the shape as well using all the functions that we saw in the previous tutorials. For example, if I switch the Z component of the sphere and say when they are greater than zero, and then I will multiply this for the sphere, we will basically just cut half of the sphere away because the Z components here are less than zero. And uh, in this case, they are greater than zero. For example, we could also take a model one of the time and then use this as the comparison. So, suck. This is what we will get. Uh, let's uh, let's scale this between minus one and one. So scale zero and one, minus one, one. Suck. So we will go from the complete sphere to something small, uh, to completely uh, kind of uh, swallow the sphere. So we can make this go slower, like this. Oh, we can just uh, can just reduce the speed here from the object actually. 
Yeah, which is pretty cool. It's a pretty cool effect. So we can use all these kind of crazy stuff now uh, inside GGen and GGL Mesh. All right, uh, we can, for example, switch also the Y and do the same trick. So instead of the Z, we could switch the Y and then it will happen on the other axis. It will happen then on the Y axis. We could switch maybe the X, the Y and the Z and do buff the thing. Do the multiplication for buff of these uh, axes. So let's see what we get. Uh, yeah, then it gets swallowed up from uh, the Z axis and the Y axis at the same time. Uh, pretty interesting. We can, for example, instead of uh, using simply the sphere coordinates, we could uh, switch the X, the Y and the Z of the sphere, and if we use just the X and the Y, then we get a circle. And for the Z, uh, we, instead of using simply the Z coordinate as they are, which will give us the sphere, we can then, for example, get the sign of the Z coordinates. Uh, let's see. Multiply this by something, like, I don't know, let's multiply this by 2 pi, so we get a complete sign uh, cycle. And, uh, whoa, this is what we get. Uh, like, uh, because the, the coordinates are completely going to to go down to minus 1 and then back to 1, but we could, for example, just sum that, sum that to the to the zeta coordinates as they are, and then maybe multiply this by something smaller so we don't completely mess up the shape, like 0.1, for example. And uh, yeah, this is what we will get, which is pretty funny. So we can really start to 3D model basically our shape. I have a couple of videos on that called uh, how to model everything in Max in which I do exactly that. I model a couple of shapes using only the gen functions. So we can then animate that that using the time, right? No time per time. Oh, let's actually set the speed back to 1. Okay, pretty interesting. Let's multiply this maybe by something bigger. Yeah, <laughs> this is what we get. Oh, uh, first, before we we close with this video, let's take a look at this other function that uh, we talked about in the last videos, the smooth step function. And, for example, we can use also the smooth step function as a value, for example, for the z-axis. When the values go between 0 and 1, this will create... Um, let's actually get the absolute value. This will create this curve that we spoke about in the last videos. So let's use the absolute of the zeta. And uh, this is going to give us values between... Uh, when this is uh, great, uh, smaller than 0, this is going to give us the 0. And when this is greater than 1, it's going to give us a 1. Let's actually bring this to 0 0.5. Oh, let's actually make the opposite, actually. Let's say when this is greater than 0 0.5, just give us 0, and then when this is 0, just give us 1. Okay, now we need to do something like that, then we can multiply that by the sign of the z-axis. Exactly, exactly. So we basically, sign will give us the, the sign, so will be will give us basically minus 1 or 1 according to uh, if the value that comes inside is, is uh, positive or negative. So if we multiply this by the sign, so minus 1 or 1, then we get, uh, uh, then we get what, we, uh, what we wanted, because then we get it um, uh, mirrored on, the, on both axes. Could, for example, try to change those values to like something 0 0.9, and then we get basically a cylinder. Pretty interesting. So we can really play around with this stuff. Ah, oh, yeah, that's pretty nice as well. Uh, we can really start to kind of model our 3D shapes with that. I'm still experimenting a bit. Exactly. So if we do something like 0 0.5 here, okay. Yeah, we get some interesting shapes. The normals are sadly not super well calculated for this object at the moment. Uh, but that's... Uh, we could calculate manually the normals, but this will involve uh, some uh, kind of complex uh, calculations that we will uh, check in the future, especially in the shader series that I, am, that I have running on the channel. 
All right, so yeah, this was uh, wanted to be kind of an introduction on the concept of creating three-dimensional shapes using the GGL Mesh. We can, of course, animate those shapes using uh, using audio stream. This is what I'm doing in the Max for Live series, and uh, we can basically modify the shapes in the every way we want using simply mathematics and gen functions. Okay, which are, by the way, the same function that you can find into shaders. So if you ever wanted to go into shaders, knowing how the functions work inside GGen uh, is very good because uh, uh, you will find the same functions inside the GL, GL, J, GLSL programming language. Okay, so it's uh, good stuff to know. Alrighty, I will leave you now with this video and see you on the next one. Thank you for following. Check my Patreon for uh, some amazing uh, Max patches and uh, some more stuff. And uh, see you soon in the next videos. Ciao! Three-dimensional objects.